ओम शांति डू यू थिंक यू हैव इनफ पावर यू वांट मोर आई वांट टू टॉक अबाउट पावर आई आल्सो रोट अ बुक कॉल्ड सायमकी व्हिच इज ऑल अबाउट पावर um in this world sometimes you feel powerless right when you feel powerless you become aware of what you cannot do and it makes you a little bit depressed right sometimes feel sad sometimes feel i would if i could but i can't these kind of things sometimes you feel that there's a lot of challenges and you just don't have what you need to express yourself you don't have what you need to deal with the challenges you don't know whether you can make it is that right and one of the things we learn in spirituality is that we are um eternal do you think that you have a soul or that you are a soul what do you think is a bit different if you have a soul where is it must be somewhere right do you have a soul pocket where you keep your soul no you don't have like that suppose if you thought the other way around you thought i'm a soul and i have a body does that feel better or the other way around feels better i'm a body and i have an immortal soul i'm a temporary body but i have an immortal soul or i'm an immortal soul and i have a temporary body what seems better and when we're talking about power i mean when you go to the gym you can increase the power of your body right you get some bigger muscles or something like that or if your body's a bit weak you can add some vitamins and you know a few special amazing filipino tropical fruits making your soul powerful is a different thing so we want to talk today about empowerment in the sense of empowering me the self the soul and we're also talking about balance of power normally this term balance of power is a political term right and you're talking about the balance between the different elements of government so that nobody takes over and becomes tyrannical so you want to have balance anyway who's in charge of your soul who's in charge you right yeah so do you want anybody else in charge of you or you want to be the top guy you want to be the top guy yes i detect a little hesitation am i right Now why would a person be a little bit hesitant about asserting their right to be the in charge of yourself There might be some reasons right Do you think that if you're completely in charge of yourself maybe something would go wrong No. No. Do you have a conscience? Anybody here doesn't have a conscience? You have one, right? Do you like your conscience? Yes. You listen to it? Not always. Sometimes. Yeah. Now that's a really strange thing to listen to your conscience sometimes. Uh if you're not listening to your conscience then who is telling you what to do if not your conscience any idea
Who? The police? The president? Your mom and dad? Or who? Who's in charge? Higher than the conscience. Anybody? The mind? The mind is in charge of the conscience. What is your mind? Have you, have you got one? I talk about conscience because of this strange phenomenon that I hear about from people that they follow it only sometimes. And that seems to me very, very strange. You see, and, and I think it's quite important to try and figure out why the situation is there. And what would be the reason why you would go against yourself? Because your conscience is part of yourself. Is that right or not? It is, huh? And your mind is also part of yourself, right? Maybe different part, but it's still part of yourself. So if you would go against your own self, what would be the benefit? I'm asking you to do some deep thinking here. Is it advantageous for you to go against your own best interests? No. So why you do it? Well, it seems to me that it's because you don't have power. Did you ever uh, hear your mind say, I would if I could, but I can't? So when you say, I can't, it means I do not have the power. One thing is, I can't, and then there's another one which is, I won't. I can't do it or I won't do it. Usually when you don't want to do it, you say, I can't do it. But that's very strange because you can perfectly well do it. But you don't want to say, I don't want to do it. You say, I can't do it. That means you're making a declaration of weakness. Isn't that strange? Can you come to lunch tomorrow? No, I'm terribly sorry, I can't. You can. But you don't want to because you're going somewhere else. But you could cancel that and go come for lunch. Right? But you make a decision. No, I do not want to do that. I want to do some other thing. Is that right? But yet we say, sorry, I can't. That's not true. So I'm, I wanted to write some things down for you, but it wasn't practical. So I'm just going to tell you some words, and if you have anything to write down, I would like you to write them down. Because in, um, in Raj Yoga, we hear about eight powers. And these are kind of difficult to really realize how powerful they are just by looking at the word. So uh, one is uh, tolerance. Can you tolerate pain? Yes, no? No. Huh? Insults? Threats? Unkind words? Loss of face. Can you? No. Tolerance. It's one of the powers. Tolerance. So you just write tolerance. Another word for tolerance that's quite good is endurance. Endurance. I like that word endurance for this. When it's too hot, you have to endure it, right? You can put the AC, you can put the fan, but sometimes you just have to endure it, and then you just do, because you have to. Um, if there is injustice done against you, have you experienced injustice any time? Yes? Well, sometimes you just have to endure that also. Because sometimes you can do something about it, but a lot of times you can't. You just have to bear it. So this ability to bear very negative things, very antagonistic things, very unpleasant things, this is a power, a spiritual power. 
And if you can manage that, then it would be said, yeah, this is a spiritually powerful person. Can you go on the cross like Jesus Christ and not make a fuss? I don't think so. Right? Sometimes you say, such and such a thing is the cross I have to bear. Do you experience that? So this is also about endurance, tolerance, and willingness to deal with something that it would be nicer if you don't have to deal with it, but if you have to deal with it, you have the strength, the endurance, the willingness to bear it, and you bear it. And it will last for some time. It's not generally something that lasts forever. Maybe sometimes you got sick. Have you ever been sick? So you have to endure um, pain, discomfort, being in bed, being in the hospital, uh, all this type of thing, right? So there's endurance involved in that too, right? So the second word I would like you to write down is accommodation. That doesn't mean somewhere to live. Accommodation is another power which refers to your ability to flex with the situation, to accommodate something in your life that is not very nice, but you really don't have any choice, so you have to accommodate it. And this power of accommodation is like a twin with the power of endurance. So among these eight powers, there are also some twins, and um, tolerance and accommodation go together quite well as a twin. You have to tolerate something, you have to accommodate it as well, right? Okay, the third word I want you to think about is, the word is discrimination, and another word for that is discernment. So, can you tell if somebody's lying to you? Can you tell? Or oh, no? Yeah. There's a saying, you can't lie to an honest person because they'll pick it up. So if you can tell if somebody's lying to you, that means they will not be able to deceive you because you know. So it doesn't matter if they lie to you because you got it. Okay, this is a lie. Forget it. Don't take it seriously. This person's lying. And to be so clear about it that you're so sure that you don't fall into the trap, you don't get deceived, you don't get deluded. This is called power of discrimination. You can discriminate that what they say is something, but what's really going on is something else. Uh, another thing connected with the discrimination is um, to be a good judge of character. Do you know who to trust, who not to trust? Can you do that? Or do you trust somebody and then it ends up, you get betrayed? It happens, right? Have you experienced betrayal any time? Experienced betrayal? How many times? One time? Two times? Do you get betrayed again, 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 or once is enough, once bitten, twice shy? Or do you again and again go for the same kind of people that always betray you? This is another situation that happens. When a person is not a good judge of character. Do you trust yourself? We trust your judgment. Yes, no. Kids, we have some younger people. Tell me, you trust your judgment? Along with this power of discrimination, there's also judgment. That's another word. So we got four so far, that's half of them. Tolerance, accommodation, 
discrimination or discernment, and then the fourth one is judgment. Now, any time you have to do something, or say something, or think something, you require these two powers of um, discernment or discrimination and uh, judgment. Because when you have to think something or say something or do something, it's in some or another circumstance. So some situation is there, right? So for example, my situation here is I have a topic I have to talk about which is called balance of power, you see. And then you're in front of me, so I have to say something to you which is meaningful, relevant, and interesting. Otherwise, you'll say, I want my money back. Is that right? So what I need to do is discern what is of interest and relevance to you. Is that right? Because if I don't get it right, then we're not communicating well. And then, having picked up what's of interest to you, then I have to decide or judge what will I actually say. You know, because I think, you know, among all the great sins, we had a list of them earlier on, but nobody ever writes that a big sin is to be boring. What do you think? Have you, you had at school, did you have boring teachers? Yeah, right? You can't learn anything from a boring teacher. Do you have boring relatives? <laughs> so you could avoid spending too much time with them because you keep them. Should we do something else, you know? So it's very important to be interesting and relevant. Relevance is important, right? So part of discernment, when you want to think or say or do something in any situation, what you do, your thought, word, and action has to be relevant, has to be interesting, has to be something, you know, that there's gonna be some worthwhile result. Otherwise, you would be classified as a nutcase, cuckoo, you know. You have to decide what the menu is for Christmas. You have to think, oh, what are the people like, you know? How many people are there? What's the budget, you know? So you have to figure out a few things. <clears throat> and then you have to think about what's available. And then you make a, your choice and you go ahead and do it, and then it will be successful. But sometimes you get distracted, right? And why is that? A part of it is because you don't have good power of concentration. So these powers are also linked with the power of concentration, which is not one of the eight, it's another one, which is to do with meditation. Because you come here because it's a meditation center, am I right? And so meditation is also very much to do with learning how to concentrate and not get distracted, to focus. So discernment is also about discerning what you have to pay attention on and what you don't have to pay attention on. So one of the things that happens when you have a discussion gathering like this or a talk, sometimes there's people, they walk in and out of the room, right? And when people walk in and out of the room, does it matter? Does it matter? It doesn't matter, right? It's nothing to do with what's going on. It definitely doesn't make any difference to you unless they walk in with a gun and they start shooting you. Then it's a matter of 
you have to pay attention. But normally they don't. They just walk in and sit down or walk out or something like this. So this is a distraction. If you're concentrated, you will in a nanosecond notice that there's something going on that is not of interest, so you don't get distracted. But you're using your power of discrimination to decide, do I need to do something about this or not, in a flash, right? Because if someone comes in with a gun, you need to immediately do something. I don't know exactly what. I don't think we have a plan for evacuation, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes. I was in Brazil, and we were somewhere, I forgot which place, and uh, this did happen, you know, because in Brazil, this sort of thing does happen. And um, it was okay in the end, but it was an example of, excuse me, stop this and deal with that. <laughs> but you have to immediately decide what to do. Otherwise, sometimes if something really scary happens, you freeze, you don't know what to do. But if you're um, trained in disaster management of any different type, you know, it could be you get um, a hurricane or a typhoon, there's a typhoon coming along, you know what to do, right? Because you're trained in that. Or an earthquake comes, you know what to do. A volcano starts throwing stuff. You know what to do because it's part of the anticipatable, uh, unexpected situations. So whenever you get anything like this, you use your discernment power to immediately switch your attention somewhere. Otherwise, you use your discernment power to let yourself know I don't have to spend more than a nanosecond on this distraction. If you are totally focused and you never pay attention to what's going on, then it would be said there's something seriously wrong with you. Right? So we're not talking about concentration to the exclusion of common sense. But concentration with this ability to instantly know I need to deal with something or I don't. You know, if you're sitting somewhere and you start smelling the smell of burning, what's that? You have to go check. There may be a fire or you may have left something in the grill and forgotten about it or something. No, I mean, it happens that old people forget. And the short-term memory, you know? So you could put the toast on in one of those toaster ovens and it could catch fire. And you say, I don't know what the next door neighbors are doing. <laughs> it's not the next door neighbors, it's you. So we have to have special arrangements for people who forget because they're old. It's not bad to be old, but it's inconvenient because you forget things. So we have to make some extra special arrangements. So for that, you have to discern, you know. A time comes when the old person should not be driving. Am I right? Especially around here, you know. You've got to be very sharp. You've got to know about 150 eyes in all directions and knowing what's coming. And you have to be quick and expect the unexpected. Once you get a bit old, you're slower. So somebody else needs to drive. Is that right? No good idea. So judgment works together with discernment because you have to understand what the situation is and what is required, what the options are, and you have to do it quick. And then decide and then act. So this is another of these twins, the power of discrimination and the power of judgment. So they're working together. Okay, we'll go for another power and that is the power of cooperation. Cooperation. That means sometimes you have to cooperate with 
someone, sometimes someone has to cooperate with you. So the power of cooperation works both ways. There are moments when you use your power of discrimination for, do I need to cooperate here? Do I need to help or not? You know, and, and this happens like uh, somebody falls down in front of you, right, in the road. Somebody falls down. And some people say, oops, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to just let this person lie down in the street bleeding because I don't want to get involved. Right? It's a choice. A lot of people make that choice. But if you look at it in terms of, is that a good uh, karma? You may need to think, you know, is it, is it a sin of omission or what? Might be, right? I once had an experience many, many years ago. I used to ride motorbike. And I had in London motorbike accident. So I came down motorbike on top of me. Lots of people walking by. Lots of people walking by, walking by. I said, "Yeah, can you please get this motorbike off me? You know, I'm in a really difficult situation." No. Nope. Uh, go by, go by. I said. Are these people, you know, what's wrong with them? There was a guy on a building site up on the top who saw this quite far away, came all the way down, came along, took the motorbike off of me. It wasn't a bad accident, but it's a bit difficult to get a motorbike off you when you're under it, right? And you're a girl, you know, it's not like you're a big guy. So, you know, so I remembered that. It was maybe 60 years ago, or 55 years ago. Still I remember. Why? Because it strikes you, hey, people in large numbers have this idea that they're not going to help you. And they think it's cool, but I don't think it's cool. Because if it happened in front of me, I would give a hand, you know? So different people, some people they like to help, some people they don't like to help because they don't want to get involved, you know. But they are involved because they did a sin of omission and it went in their record, right? There's a celestial record, right? And when they come to Judgment Day, they will get this CCTV footage and God will say, look, what you did, you got it. X mark for that, minus point. They'll say, oh, well, hmm, I thought it was the right thing to do. And he'll say, you thought wrong. <laughs> so discrimination you need, together with co cooperation. When somebody needs help, like somebody might be um, sitting on the street and why are they on the street because drugs alcohol etc they say can you please help me I need some money and what will they do with that money buy more drugs and more alcohol so if you help them you give them money and they buy alcohol then that goes as a minus point against you because you facilitated their addiction. So that is like not the right thing to do. At such a time, you don't need to use the power of cooperation. You need to use the power of discrimination and judgment, which says, you know what? You do not need money from me but I just happen to have a sandwich in my pocket. I'm going to give you that because that is going to be helpful for you. You look pretty skinny. I think you're hungry. But if a person is an addict, they don't care about anything except getting a fix. You know that, right? So anything you do that helps them to do that, that cooperate in their negative karma, that's negative. So that would be misplaced cooperation. You know? So together with the power of cooperation is the power that we heard about in the meditation earlier from Beng, uh, the power to face. 
And we in Brahma Kumaris, we have a, um, an image which describes these powers. And uh, I can't see it, but sometimes we have these powers in, in images on the walls around here. But the image for the power to face is somebody who is on, in their um, funeral because the one thing that people really are not very keen on is death, right? Do you like death? You don't want to die, right? And you don't want your relatives and friends to die either. You don't want your dog to die. You don't really like death at all, right? But every so often, it happens. And you have to deal with it. And when a death of someone really close to you happens, and then it, it brings up many emotions, right? Because you experience loss, you experience bereavement, you experience sorrow, you experience that they left you, you experience, um, you know, say you're living with someone and that person dies and then you're alone. So all these, it brings up a lot of very difficult feelings inside. And so the power to face is a power to be able to deal with and face these very real feelings which are hard you know, and which you don't want to have that happen, but you can't undo death. It doesn't happen. You know, sometimes a person dies and they die very slowly, slowly, and you know, and maybe they have some medical condition and the doctors will tell you, okay, the prognosis for this person is one month or two years, or something like this, you know. If somebody's on dialysis, uh, it's common to be able to handle it for about 10 years, you know. So you have uh, some advance warning that you have this much time. So one thing is you have to prepare for your own death. So you have to think, okay, what is that? You know, and how do I do that? Because is death something that you do or is it something that happens to you? Or, you know, what's this mystery called death? Because we don't really know too much about death, right? Except that it does happen and that nobody is exempt. But we don't have much information about it. Sometimes it comes very suddenly and unexpectedly, like a car accident, or maybe somebody has a massive heart attack or a massive stroke, and they're just fine one day and then one minute later. And so when there's a shock, as well as a loss, then you need the power to face even more because you have to face the shock and the loss. Two things, you know. And it, it takes a lot out of you to be able to process these things is you need inner power. So all, all of these things that I'm talking about, they need inner power, but you need to apply the inner power a little bit differently in one case or another case, you see. So all of it is powers. But it's like electric power, right? We have electricity in this building. And some of it is making the fan turn. Some of it is making the microphone work. Some of it is making the lights work. Some of it is making the air conditioning work. Uh, some of it is uh, making your um, CCTV work. You know, if it gets cold, then you need some to create heat. Then there's various different devices. You, you need electricity to make your TV work. 
If you have an electric car, then you need electricity for that. If you don't have an electric car, you still need power, but you're doing it by internal combustion engine, so you need petrol. But power, just straight power, say we stick with electric power, is energy. And you use that energy for different purposes, using it through different machines, different devices. In the same way, spiritual power is applied in different cases by different types of powers. So the power to face is not the same as the power to judge, but it's still a power. And the power to endure or tolerate is not the same as the power to face. It's different, slightly different, or sometimes very different. Another aspect of the power to face is the power to say no. Are you good at saying no when you have to say no? A lot of people have a problem with that especially women. Why is it especially women? I think some of it has to do with conditioning. Um, because women are, are um, prepared or trained or conditioned to be helpful. Right? If you're helpful, if you're cooperative, if you are willing and available and if somebody asks you for something and you say yes, that's good. If you say no, that's like not good, you know? And, and this begins from your very early childhood for women especially. For men, uh, you're more, um, you have different conditioning. It's more about asserting yourself and saying, this is what I will do, this is what I won't do, um, because you have to play a different role. And this is why, um, generally speaking, because of this conditioning, women have more of a problem facing a situation where you have to say no, because you're so much trained to say yes, that when you need to say no, you won't. Have you experienced that? Or sometimes there are beliefs in the atmosphere that if a woman says no, what she really means is yes. This refers to sex. <laughs> More than anything, it refers to that. And so you need to be a little bit more clear when it's yes and when it's no. Because you have a right over your body. Am I right or not? Yes, no. But some people don't agree with that. But it's an example of where you're using the power to face. I say, not now, tomorrow or later or next week or I don't feel well or something like this, you know. But sometimes you just need to be able to say no. You know, can you just, have you heard this? Can you just, can you just do this? Can you just look after my kids? Can you just drive somebody to, this? can you do this? And it piles up, right? And you have to be able to say, this is what I will do, and this is what I won't do. Am I right? Sometimes it's difficult because of this conditioning which says that if you say no, it means that you're not very good as a person. So it's like you get these situations where you have to really judge and discern what's happening here and then sometimes assert yourself and say, no, I cannot do all this. It's not realistic, there's not time, uh, it's not reasonable. Set limits and boundaries. So the power to face is connected with setting limits and boundaries. 
and being able to represent your position. You have a position and can you speak for yourself and say, in this situation, this is what I can do, this is what I can't do. And it's not really what I can and can't do, it's what I will do and what I won't do. But sometimes this conditioning gets in the way of that. So then you need more power to be able to actually do what is really the correct thing. Because sometimes the correct thing or what the conscience will tell you is different from your conditioning. And then you have something of an ethical dilemma. And when you have an ethical dilemma, then you have to again go to your power of discrimination to evaluate all the issues involved in this dilemma so that you can make a good decision and then you can act on that. And there will be people who are displeased when you do the right thing. Have you experienced that? So then you have to face their displeasure and that's just the way it is. But you're sensitive, right? So when you have to face somebody's displeasure, which could be anger or even violence, and you're sensitive, it's a bit difficult. So you need the power to face for that. So the power to face is quite a useful uh, power that comes in many different um, formats. The last two are very subtle. One is called um, the power to withdraw. The power to withdraw. And the power to withdraw has to do with when you have to do something and when you don't have to do something. So there are many situations where the best thing to do is do nothing. You have to figure it out, you have to evaluate, judge, discern. Okay, in this situation, taking everything into consideration, the best thing is to do is do nothing. You know? Because anything you do will muck it up. And so you just have to do nothing. Sometimes, um, I, I've seen the situation where uh, on the street, you have a husband beating up his wife, and then it looks like really dangerous, so the police comes along, and the police looks at the situation and says, you know what, we're not going to do anything. And you look at that and you say, what? How come you're not going to do anything? And they will say, well, um, because this lady is not going to press charges. That's why. Because we've done this story before. And so you have a situation, domestic violence situation, where the woman will not press charges. So the police cannot do anything anyway. And if they know in advance, because this is happening all the time with this particular couple, they say, best thing, do nothing. And everybody around says, how is this possible? This is a violent situation here. But in fact, they have no choice. They have to do nothing. You know, Sometimes the laws become different and whether somebody presses charges or not, the law allows for police action, but where the law requires the person to press charges, then they have to do nothing. That's the way the law is set up. If you don't like it, you have to vote it differently. But it's a reality, you know. And there are many situations where you, you try to prevent somebody from harming themselves full-grown adults who know perfectly well that to do such and such a thing is harmful and you try and prevent them. Have you tried this and they're not interested? 
they just go do it anyway. So what are you going to do? You have to do nothing. You can't do anything. Withdraw. Sometimes you get in a situation where whoever is opposing you is 50 times stronger than you. A big Goliath and you a little David, right? Without a slingshot. What are you going to do? You know. Or sometimes in situation of war, they have to retreat, right? Because if you don't retreat, you're finished. So you have to know when to face and when to withdraw. Sometimes it's difficult to make that decision to withdraw and do nothing, but yet your power of discrimination, your experience tells you it's the right thing to do in this situation at this moment. I have to do nothing. Withdraw, consolidate my situation, maybe deal with it another way later, make myself more powerful, something. But right here, right now, do nothing. It can also happen when you're preparing yourself for death. I had a situation where my brother's wife was diagnosed with extremely rapid um, multiple sclerosis. You know, multiple sclerosis is like a, a scarring of the nerves and it comes in attacks, you know. And some people, they can have MS for 30 years, slowly, slowly, slowly. But this case was very fast. So she had a few attacks, and then it became really final. So he called me. He said, I need you here right now. My wife is going. You come. So I came. And this was in England. So the hospital said to us, OK, we give you three options. We can put her on full life support, and she will get two weeks life. We can put her on partial life support, and she'll get one week life. Or we can do nothing. What do you want? The whole family said, do nothing. Do nothing. Let her go without tubes and this and that, without force, without any of this stuff. And just, we will be with her until she goes, but do nothing. And everybody was really very happy with that. So sometimes you have to do nothing in a situation like that where the, the death is inevitable. You know, sometimes you have to be really fast and do something, you know. Sometimes the ambulance is stuck in traffic and that's it. You couldn't do what you had to do because of circumstances out of your control then you have to let go. So that is also power, letting go. And the last power is called packing up. The power to pack up. And this power to pack up has to do with your thinking. You get into obsessive compulsive thinking. You're sitting there thinking, 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 thinking. After half an hour, you can be pretty exhausted just because you were thinking. You didn't do anything else except have negative thinking. So this power to pack up is the power to tell your mind, okay, now, stop. There's nothing you can do, just stop. Let go. Let it be. You know this Beatles song, Let It Be? It's a very good song for this, for the power to pack up. You can listen to it, it's on the YouTube or something like this. And it's in the context of religion, right? Let it be. There's nothing you can do. Thinking about it, worrying about it, what if, if only, you know, these kinds of thoughts we have to lay them to rest and just let it be. 
These are the eight powers that are defined in the system of Raj Yoga. Of course, there are many other powers, the power of silence, the power of love, the power to delay your reaction, many, many things. But these are very predominant ones. And if you spend a little time thinking about them and how you have to use one with the other or one in balance with the other, then you find that it's a really good recipe or toolkit for handling a lot of the challenges that you get in life. I'm going to give you a few thoughts, a little bit meditation commentary. So listen to the thoughts and let your mind move naturally and gently with the power of the music and let yourself go into the meditation where you can really go deep and feel the absorption of spiritual energy that comes when you go into a soul conscious stage and you go into connectedness or communion with the divine, with God. Turn the attention within. Let yourself slow down. Focus on the point of light within. In the center of the forehead, the seat of the soul. Feel the stillness. Let the music carry you deeply inside. there within you. <coughs> Feel the purity of your heart.
by the Supreme One. Turn your attention above, beyond the day to day. another region. There's a world beyond this world. A world where God dwells. Go there. And connect with the source, the light, feel that energy. Allow yourself to be touched by that one. Open up your heart and let his love enter your being. Let that energy flow through you. Bringing strength to every part of your being. Take in light. Take in the sweet flow of goodness. Then gently let yourself return to the everyday world. Reconnect with your body in this room and just feel how you have taken in that power and it's now there for you. You can use it. Om Shanti.